All right, so I think we'll get started now. Hello, everyone. It's great to see everyone here. Uh, it's our great honor to have Itai Gorich from uh, Northwestern University presenting at the SNAP seminar today. Um, so Itai is a professor at the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University. Uh, he got his PhD from Decision Risk and Operations Division at Columbia Business School in 2008. After his PhD, he spent eight years at Kellogg and four years at Cornell uh, University's New York campus before returning to uh, Kellogg in 2021. His research interests are um, the performance analysis and optimization of stochastic processing networks. Um, and Itai's work has won numerous awards, uh, including two times of the APS Best Publication Award. Um, without further ado, uh, Itai, I'll let you get start from here. Thank you, Jing. Uh, thanks to the uh, founders and uh, current organizers of these uh, wonderful seminar series. Um, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, near optimal policy for dynamic matching. I'll be looking to my left or right, depending how you see me, because my slides are there, um, but I see uh, all of you as well. Uh, this is uh, John work with uh, Suleiman Karimov. In fact, this was uh, part of his uh, dissertation. Suleiman is uh, joining uh, Rice University in the summer. And the slides I'm using are from his uh, job market presentation. Uh, and with Itaya Shlagi, who is uh, co-advising uh, Suleiman together with me. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to try to uh, talk about the results in two papers. I'm not going to get too much into the math, but more uh, try to convey the interesting aspects of the problem, the nature of the problem and the nature of the results. Uh, Suleiman is also here, so everybody should feel free to ask questions on the chat and he can respond uh, if you have any questions. And, and I also going to uh, pause uh, here and there for uh, questions if there are any. Uh, can you hear me clearly? Just to make sure before I get started. Okay, good. So, uh, First of all, there's, uh, in terms of motivation, there are several settings today where uh, uh, decisions have to be made uh, about matching different agents. The agents might be of different types, like matching drivers to riders in uh, uh, ride sharing or matching packages to trucks in logistics or uh, in kidney and organ transplants, which is an example I'm going to expand a bit more about. In all these cases, you have agents that arrive dynamically and uh, then they interact or are matched to produce a certain outcome. Um, so let me talk a bit about kidney exchanges uh, because it's a useful platform to motivate some key ingredients of our model. So the way kidney exchanges work are as follows. Uh, let's say I need a kidney. Uh, my wife is willing to donate a kidney to me. However, we are not blood type compatible and hence she cannot donate a kidney directly to me. What we do then is we, or through our physician, uh, we sign up to a kidney exchange. This is a platform that will look for another pair of a donor and recipient so that the uh, donor of pair one can uh, donate a kidney to the recipient of pair two, and the donor of pair two can donate a recipient uh, a kidney to the recipient of pair one. So basically there is an exchange of kidneys. Uh, this doesn't have to be a uh, only between two agents. In this case, an agent is a pair. It doesn't have to be between two pairs. It can also be in cycles. So what you see here on the right is what I will call a multi-way match, where the recipient of pair one donates a kidney to the, uh, sorry, the donor of pair one donates a kidney to the recipient of pair two, pair two donates a kidney to the recipient of pair three, and so on. And in practice, uh, we've observed uh, cycles that are even bigger than this. Uh, different matches. So one, one takeaway is that we might have multi-way matches. The other one is the different matches result in different rewards, right? Some, some allocations of kidneys to patients might produce a better quality of life in the remaining life, and some matches might produce lower rewards. So we're going to have a model that has different rewards for different matches. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so this is just summarize what I said. And uh, you know, the types of the types of agents you might have might depend on blood compatibility and other uh, par parameters like sensitivity and other things that are important for organ transplants. Uh, what platforms typically do, these kidney exchanges, is that once in a while they look at the lines or the cues 
of people uh, waiting to be uh, to receive a kidney uh, or donate the kidney and they perform matches. Uh, <clears throat> and I want to illustrate kind of something that is via very simple example, something that is going to be key for the talk. Uh, so let's look at this graph. Each circle here, think of that in the example I just had as representing a pair. Okay, so an agent is a pair, pair A, pair B, pair C, and assume A can match with B, hence there is an edge between them, and B can match with C, hence there is an edge between them, but they cannot match directly with C. Now, if this is my current state of the world, uh, I can decide to match B and C that will produce maybe some reward, in which case I'm matching only two of my individuals. It could be that a minute or a day after I do this, there is an, another arrival of a type or a pair D here, and pair D can match with C. Okay, so if I perform what I did and I match immediately, then I end up matching only two individuals. However, if I waited just a day for this one to arrive, I could have performed two matches, in which case I would have four individuals matched. Right, so this is kind of a fundamental trade-off in this problems that if you wait, you might see more opportunities that will allow you to get better outcomes in terms of the number of individuals match or the rewards collected. Um, <clears throat> so on one hand, waiting could lead to more matches. On the other hand, there's many reasons why you wouldn't want to uh, wait. And let me already point out a caveat in this example that just to make sure that uh, it's clear. Here, I kind of, my world ended after the arrival of D. But of course, in a dynamic setting, I will have more arrivals and these additional arrivals might allow me then to correct my mistake, right? And match those that remain unmatched before, right? So the question is, how much am I losing from this uh, being greedy and matching as I go? Now, in practice, we observe in the world of kidney exchanges, two kinds of regimes. Uh, we, we have the US and then we have the rest of the world, uh, as is often the case in uh, various settings. Uh, so in the rest of the world, uh, so here you have a table, you see the Netherlands, the UK, Canada, and Australia. The way these exchanges perform matches is they wait for three months, see the list of patients and donors of pairs, and then solve for a gigantic uh, static match. They perform the transplants, and then they wait another three months before the next point in time where they'll make a decision. Okay, so they have this batching period where every three months, months they act. In contrast, in the US, there are several exchanges that are independent of each other, and uh, they perform matches fairly frequently, sometimes as frequently as every week or every day. So they are more on the greedy side. And Anecdotally, there is evidence that this is done a bit because of concern to patient health, but also because of competition. In many countries, there is a single exchange run by the government. Um, Itaya Shlagi, my co-author, is actually the one that wrote the underlying software of the Israeli kidney exchange. Uh, so you have these governmental uh, organizations. In the US, there are different exchanges and they run independently. And one could think that they have a concern that if they don't match patients, the patients, which is a donor, a recipient, as well as a donor, will actually sign up for a different exchange and opportunity will be lost for the original. So let me just uh, state my objectives and then pause to see if there are any questions. Uh, so one can think about different potential objectives. One could be maximize reward. One could be minimize holding costs or a combination of their combination thereof. I'm going to focus mostly on maximizing rewards and if time permits, at the very end, I'll say something about holding costs. It is important that in these settings, there are only two questions. When do I perform a match? And once I perform a match, which match or matches do I perform? Okay, these are the only questions to address. And the trade-off that I tried to illustrate already via simple example is, do I match now, given what I have, or is there value in actually waiting? Well, let me reverse the question in the way that might be also useful. I'm going to try to ask, how much do I lose by actually acting frequently? Okay, even if I abstract from questions of abandonments and so on, right? Even I remove it. Is there any loss from actually uh, matching frequently relative to waiting and then matching? Uh, any questions? I guess 
for the specific uh, example about organ transplantation, yeah. um, I just want to understand like uh, how big is the market for live donors and how big is it for these diseased, for, for these uh, people who die and donate? So, you so cannot see. This is the exchanges are only for live donors. I see. Uh, the size of the of the markets, uh, relative size of the markets, I'm not sure. I'm not the expert on this in this team, uh, but I'm sure Ashlagi can. I saw that he's here too. Maybe he can give you some numbers uh, on the chat about the relative contribution of disease donors versus kidney exchanges. So for live donors, even though I sign up as a pair, you mean that I can actually match this pair to, to different people in this network? Is that the idea why you want to? I, I would imagine like I would have a donor who's willing to donate to me, but when we register, I can be matched to another donor. Is that the idea? Yes. So there, there would be a pair and a pair and then there's an exchange. I see. Okay, but it's useful for the for the model perspective. These are going to be just one agent, right? So I'm going to treat one agent as a one pair as an agent that can match with certain types of pairs. It cannot match with everybody because there are constraints of blood compatibility, right? So I'm going to have multiple types of agents. Think of each type as let's say a blood type, and then they can be matched with others. But for the model, are you assuming these two sites uh, arrive to the system independently or they are they I all- I show the model in one slide. Okay, all right. And, and if it's not clear, then I'm happy to get back to this question. Uh, I had a quick question. So you don't take fairness into account how long somebody has been waiting is not relevant. In the beginning, I'm not going to take that into account. At the end, I'll mention the case where you can actually use our results to get something about waiting costs. But no fairness for now. So I'm just going to focus on this question of um, how much do I have to wait to perform better matches? Is there value to creating thickness? Or um, if I have to wait, how much do I have to wait? Can I quantify it? Okay, so I'll, I'll show it in the model in a moment. Uh, okay, so of course this idea of the value of waiting has been observed by in ride sharing as well. I'm not going to argue that our model covers ride sharing, but maybe it provides some insight for it. Um, Lyft now, at least in New York City, uh, would give you a discount if you're willing to wait longer for a match. Okay, so that you, you could maybe uh, conjecture that that's based on their understanding. If people wait, are willing to wait a bit more, better matches can be performed. And uh, Uber also has a nice graphic on his website where they show that uh, if you wait just a bit, um, you can see more arrivals and then perform better matches that would uh, reduce overall waiting time. Okay, so as I said, the, our key point is to understand trade-off of uh, the value of delay. Let me jump directly to the model then. Uh, here's the model. Uh, I'm going to have a set of agent types. So here in the graph on the left, I have a network where I have seven agent types numbered from one through seven. Um, there is a set of feasible matches. So here in the bottom of this graph, you see four feasible matches. These are not servers. These are just connect, create connections between different types. So for example, here, type one is connected to type two through match one. This match, match, match one matches one item from here, one item from here, one item from here, and one item from here. Okay, so a match of type one here is a match that simultaneously takes one item for each of these four queues. Okay, and it will create a cycle where people transfer kidneys in that example over the cycle, okay? A match of three will take just one item from four and one item from five. So the set of edges in this network specify what are the feasible matches. Okay. Jing, does this address your question from before? I see. So this is not a, a bipartite graph, right? So I'll get back to bipartite later with if you have multi-way matches, it's not that easy to do it as a bipartite graph. Sometimes you can. Mm -hmm. If you have two-way matches, you can always draw it as a, no, not always, you can sometimes draw it as a bipartite graph. So the answer is sometimes you can draw it as a bipartite, sometimes not. I see. But, but you can imagine that I can, in some cases, put some of the agent types on the other side and call them servers. And some of the agents keep them as customers, right? I see. Um, and here on the right-hand side, you have a network with only two-way matches. So here, type uh, match of 
type one matches an item of one and two, match of type two matches two and three and so on. Okay, matches once they happen, they're instantaneous. Okay, so there's no processing per se here. There's no service time. It's just items waiting queue. Once they're matched, they immediately leave the system. Okay, and we're going to say a network is two-way if each match is only two agent types connected to it and multi-way if there's more than that. And uh, finally, a, a kind of modeling ingredient that will appear later, I'm going to use M for the incidence matrix of matches to types. So for example, here, I have four types and three matches. So match number, uh, type number one participates only in match number one. And hence there is a one here and zeros elsewhere. Okay, so it's just the, what we are used to as the resource consumption matrix. We call it M for matching. Uh, let me show you the dynamics. I'm going to assume the dynamics are finite. Um, sorry, finite and discrete time horizon. There's one agent arrival per period. Okay, so every period I have an arrival and there's an arrival of type I with probability lambda I. I'm going to assume no abandonments. Okay, so people are willing to wait forever. And performing a match gives me a reward and the reward might change from one match to the other. So for example, here, let's look at the dynamics. Let's say I have an arrival of type one. There's no match available in this network at this moment. All the other queues are empty. So I have no, no option but to wait. Let's say there is then an arrival of type three. Uh, still no match available in this network. I could match two to three and one to two, but there is no direct match with one to three. Once there is a type two arriving, now I have two options. And I can choose, do I match two to one or do I match two to three? I could also choose to wait. Uh, as we will show in this case, it doesn't really make sense. Then if I decide to perform a match here, I get a reward of R2. Okay, so this is, these are the dynamics. Uh, the decision is when and who to match. And I'm going to have a process D that is going to track the cumulative number of matches we perform of each type up to time T. To your question about bipartite, notice that I could also plot this graph differently, at least in this case where I have only two-way matches and put type two and type four in the bottom and then it would look like a two-way graph, right? Where it's only just an edge connecting each two types. Okay, so let me uh, spend some time defining the notion of optimality because this is important and a bit tricky. Uh, the, I have the expected total value up to time T collected by policy. So I'm going to denote uh, my policy by D. And then I have the expected, the inner product of the reward and the number of matches performed from each type. Uh, and this is the reward that my policy collects up to time T. Okay, there's no holding cost. My upper bound at each specific time T, notice that because people do not abandon, what is the best thing I can do for a specific fixed time T? Not do anything up to time T and then perform the best static match. Right? I observe everybody, it's like seeing the future. I observe everybody that arrived, and at that point I do the best possible static match solving this optimization problem, which is just a matching problem. Right? There's, you can never do anything better than that for a fixed time. Okay, so this is going to be for each time t, my upper bound. Wait and do nothing, then do it your best static match. You could also think of this as a, as a real time or a dynamic decision maker that has the opportunity at each point in time to unmatch from before and say, oops, I made a mistake. I actually wanted to do a ma different match for this time. But it's easier to think of this as just, I wait, I do nothing until time T, then I match. Okay, so this is for each fixed T and upper bound. We're going to say that the policy is hindsight optimal if it's optimal for all T greater than zero. So it's a dynamic adaptive policy that at any point in time does almost as well as the upper bound, okay? Another way to say it is that my errors do not accumulate. At every time T, I can do almost as well as I would have done by waiting until that time and uh, then performing the best static match. Okay, so I'm trying to be nearly optimal at all times simultaneously. So it's a slightly non-standard uh, way to think of a notion of optimality, but it does capture the 
key question we want to ask. Is being short-term optimal bad for long-term optimality? If something is hindsight optimal, then it means it's not. It means that being optimal at each time t is feasible simultaneously, which means that what I do now does not compromise my optimality in the future. Okay, so I, I try to explain the same thing in multiple ways because I know this is kind of a tough to uh, process, but this is the notion of optimality. Uh, let me say this slide and then I'll pause for a see if, again if there's any questions. Uh, so it is reasonable to expect that mistakes accumulate over time. And indeed, in general, that is the case. So I'm going to show you that you have to impose assumptions to be able to be optimal simultaneously at all times t. It doesn't come for free. Um, so we try to characterize such conditions, uh, construct simple policies that generate hindsight optimality, uh, and also try to quantify this constant as an explicit function of the network parameters. Okay, so we try to say, uh, how close can you get to this uniform in time optimality? And in those cases where you, uh, and, and there's also, sorry, the other question is, do I have to wait and can, or can I be greedy? And what we will show is that in some networks, you don't have to wait. You look at your queue, you perform the best possible match and you continue. In some networks, you have to wait and we'll quantify exactly how long you have to wait. Okay, so in the examples I showed from the kidney exchanges in Europe and Canada, they were waiting three months. The question is why three months? Is it enough to wait one month? Is it enough to wait two weeks? Okay, so we try to find that optimal resolving period as a function of the network parameters. Questions? Maybe a quick one. I guess your big O1 there depends on lambda. In, in some way, the arrival rates and things like this is—is is, is that correct? And 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 in those ones where it is sensitive, I guess is that is that a bit, yeah. it, uh, It's a function of one very specific uh, parameter yeah. that comes out of an optimization problem. Okay. So it's yeah. not lambdas themselves; it's something lambdas produce, and it could be many lambdas that produce the same constant. So I'll, I'll show that in a minute. Okay. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. A few words about the literature, uh, which is kind of interesting because of the modeling language and the differences between uh, disciplines or streams of literature. There's a lot of work on dynamic matching in random graphs. Uh, this line of work uh, models agents as nodes that arrive on a graph and connect randomly to nodes that are already in the graph. And then tries to optimize the matches and decide which matches to perform. There's a long history of, uh, or relatively long history of uh, work in this domain. Um, much of the earlier work uh, considered homogeneous match values. All matches produce the same reward, in which case what you're trying to do is maximize the number of matches that you perform. So it's different in that sense. Um, there is a recent paper that does have heterogeneous rewards by uh, Jose Blanchett, Larry Wine, and Marty Ryman, but has a single class. So there's no compatibility graph. There's really one class. But because there's random heterogeneous rewards, there are still interesting questions to look at there. But it's a bit difficult to compare the settings. Uh, the language modeling that we use here is that of dynamic matching in queue networks, where there's a finite set of types and types weights in their dedicated queues. That's a distinction relative to random graphs. And this is a non exhaustive uh, list of papers here. Um, let me mention uh, one paper that is. Uh, related from Ali Awad and uh, I think his uh, student, which is a model that is actually more general than our model in multiple ways, but because of the generality, the types of results that can obtain are uh, cruder notions of optimality. Um, so the, the price of generality is that we go a bit more specific and by that are able to characterize some things that are a bit more subtle. Uh, many of these papers focus on long run objectives and, and actually a very impressive result on those. We notice we take a simple model, but we focus on this kind of transient in some way. We're trying to understand how does the cost of being optimal now impact my ability to be optimal later? So it's a slightly different uh, question there. Okay, uh, let me skip the, the last bullet here. Um, there's also something related in the literature and auctions, uh, and I'm happy to uh, exchange emails later about this with people if anybody's interested. 
Okay, so let me get to um, moving towards the result. Uh, so we start like it's common in, in the study of Q networks with a static planning problem. So uh, this is the deterministic counterpart where the arrivals are replaced by the arrival rates. I'm trying to maximize the rewards collected. Z here is going to be a proxy for in first order, how many matches of each type should I be doing? Uh, this constraint is the constraint that the number of matches, the number of matched items of each type is less than the demand for that type. Okay, so it's MZ less than lambda. I just wrote it in standard form because this flag variables are going to be useful. Um, so this finds the optimal matching uh, in first order, ignoring stochasticity. And uh, we're going to have four important sets coming out from this static planning problem. The first is the set of what we call active matches. These are matches that the static planning problem performs in a substantial level, so non-zero. There's going to be a set of redundant matches. These are matches that the static planning problem says we should not perform any. In principle, we know from papers in Q networks that the fact that the static planning problem says do not use these matches does not mean that in the stochastic system, you will never use them. But it is a function of the assumption we're going to show later that actually you will not use these matches also in the stochastic system. We're going to uh, similarly divide the queues or the agent types into two groups. The under-demanded types are those for which the slack is positive. This means these are types that I, in first order, I'm not going to serve all of their demand. Some of their demand is going to remain unserved. And the over-demanded types are those that their demand is served fully. There's nobody in first order waiting in the queue. All their demand is served by this first order proxy. Now, this gives you some guidance on what good policies would look like. Good policies should perform very few of the redundant matches. And they should try to keep these queues of the over-demanded types relatively short, right? Because in first order, I know I want to keep those queues empty. I want to serve all of the arrivals. Okay, so this is static planning problem, um, very similar to what we see in Q networks. The only thing that is slightly different here in this model is that I don't have a natural notion of servers, right? Uh, customer or an agent is also is a customer, but it's also a server for another customer because when they match, they live together the system. Okay, uh, two initial observations that I'm going to spend some time on because I think they're important for intuition. Uh, the first one is that if you have multi-way matches, here in this graph with seven types, there is match number one here that serves both type six, one, two, and four. So whenever this match is performed, I have four agents simultaneously being served. That's what it means to be a multi-way match. And it's a very high value. It has a reward of 100. Okay. So it's clear I want to do this sometimes. What you see here on the right is the optimal solution of the static planning problem. The specific values do not matter that much. Um, I just want to focus on three important cues here. The static planning problem says that, let me show this here, that Q7, 3, and 5 are going to be in first order non-empty. Now, this is expected if you look at the numbers. Uh, here I put the arrival rates up to a multiplying constant. They have to sum up to 1, so just normalization. But you see, here I have arrivals of 16. Here I have arrivals of 8. So I can do at most eight matches per unit of time here, right? Because this is required for that, which means that I always have leftovers here. That's unavoidable. Similarly, here I have a demand of 64, but for this match, I need to use all of type six and I have 32 of those, which means that Q will also accumulate here. Okay, and the same is true for Q3. So I have three Qs here where it's unavoidable that work will accumulate. Now let's see what happens if I try to perform a greedy policy, any greedy policy. So let's say there is an arrival of type four right here. An arrival of type four 
will always find a non-empty queue of type five here. So if I'm greedy, what I'm going to do, I'm going to match. With type five, I'm going to perform this match and the item will live. The same is true for type six here. As soon as they arrive, because the queue here is going to be non-empty, it's going to match with type seven and live. The problem is I need the type six and a type four and a type two and a type one present simultaneously in the system to be able to perform a match of type one. So it's kind of when I have a multi-way match, I need to protect its inputs. I need to make sure they don't escape too quickly. So I have to wait between performing matches. I cannot act greedy. I need some policy that tells me when you have multi-way matches, you need to wait a bit before you actually perform matches. So in this example, any greedy policy, no matter what it is, greedy meaning that if there is a feasible match, at least one feasible, as long as there are feasible matches, matches are performed. So here, no greedy policy can, um, can do well. So in, in general, you have to wait. The question is how long. Let me show one more example, then I'll, I'll pause again for questions. Uh, there are networks where hindsight optimality is impossible. Meaning being optimal now means being very suboptimal later. So let's consider this W kind of network that has only three types, one, two, and three. They all, all of them have the same arrival rate, a third, a third, and a third. Uh, match one has a reward of two, it's the higher value match. Match two has a lower reward of one. The static planning problem says you should perform many of these and none of these. It actually makes sense, right? There's nothing, uh, it's a third and a third. I'm going to match all these inputs and use them only for here. Uh, in this example, you cannot be hindsight optimal. And let me try to explain why. Let's say first I focus at time t. It could be a time 100 or 200 or what have you. If by time t I had more arrivals to one than I had arrivals to two, and I waited up to time t to perform matches, I would perform matches of this and I would not perform any match here, right? Because there's more arrivals here than here and I wanna use them for the, I wanna use these arrivals for the higher reward match. If it was reversed, then, okay, I, I'll match these ones and then I can use the leftovers for the lower value match, right? So time t, depending on the relationship between the arrival to one, the arrival to two, then I'll decide, do I wanna, offer, do I wanna reserve all of them for the first match, the high value one, or do I have leftovers? The same is true for time t over two. So again, at time t over two, if I have more arrivals to one than to two, then I wanna do only this match. If I have more arrivals to two than to one, then I'm okay using some of the leftovers. The problem is that when the arrival rates are equal, I could have both things. It could be that at time t over two, I wanna do some of these matches, but for optimality at t, I would actually have to reserve all the arrivals of type two for type one matches. Okay, so let me, this is not easy to explain. So let me emphasize here a key point. Because the arrival rates are equal here, it's all about the stochasticity, right? If the arrival of one is bigger than the other, then I want one outcome. If the arrival of the other is bigger, then I want the other outcome. So it's too sensitive to the stochasticity. That's what happens here. And what we have here on the right is a plot that shows that if you are optimal at t over two, then at t, you are square root of t away from uh, the upper bound. And that's kind of unavoidable. Yes, Amy. Um, just when you say no policy, I, I guess you're assuming that it's a policy that clears the network or something, because it seems like you could say I only match one and two and I ignore three. And if I did that, I think you would still get the hindsight optimal. But I think maybe that's violating your definition of admissible policy. No, if I did just that, then I would be suboptimal with high probability at T over two. If I decided, uh, if I decided that time zero, that I'm just going to drop this match. I'm just going to be, do these matches. Then with very high probability time t over two, you would be suboptimal at square root of t level. I see, thanks. No matter what the policy is. That's unavoidable, it's just the nature of arrivals. Right, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. 
Okay, so, so the key punchline is that generally it's not possible. And notice that the key challenge in this problem, and it will motivate our assumption, is that the rival rates are equal here. That means that the system is very sensitive to, to stochasticity. So the assumption we're going to impose uh, is closely related to avoiding that. Um, a sufficient condition for our assumption, but a bit too strong, is to say that if I, for any two sets of agents, any two subsets of the agent types, the arrivals, the total arrivals to one group is different than the total arrivals to the other group. This in particular would rule out this because take one group to be type two, one group to be type one, and of course the arrival rates are equal, so that violates that. Uh, this, is, uh, this has been called in the literature the general position condition, but it's a bit too strong. Our assumption is going to be as follows. We're going to assume that the LP has a unique non-degenerate solution. Um, <clears throat> in some sense, uh, this is closely related to even overloaded network, that there is some slack in, in, the, in the system. And we're going to define something that we call the general position gap. So the general position gap is as follows. I look at all the, uh, let me go back to a previous example here. I look at all the matches that I perform at a non-zero rate in the static planning problem, and I take the minimum over those matches, meaning it's the smallest non-zero match. Then I look at the, all the non-empty queues that the static planning problem identifies and look at the smallest among those queues. Now you can think about this, the, think about the queues is easier. If you think about that I have some type with leftovers, those leftovers are kind of my slack. They're a buffer that helps me protect against stochasticity, right? I have a bit too many from these arrivals and I'd be able to use them to correct for mistakes. So epsilon uh, is defined in, um, in this way. In a sense, it's a measure of the sensitivity of the network, uh, how sensitive it is to um, variations around the arrival rates. Any questions? Okay, so it comes, the important thing is that it comes naturally from the LP solution. Um, <clears throat> and uh, one thing we, it's also that we show, and, and I'm not going to say much about this, is that those matches that have zero value, well, here I don't have more, but I have here in this example, those matches that have zero value have to be dropped. Meaning no policy can use them even once every 200 years because once every 200 years accumulates over time. So mistakes would actually accumulate. So no solution should actually use, even the stochastic system under our assumption should use these matches. Okay, so we actually uh, prove that. So these matches can be dropped in which case you have subnetworks and to each subnetwork you can apply uh, whatever policy that you need. Okay, so let me uh, show the, the main first result uh, and then see if there are any questions. So what you're going to do in general when we have multi-way matches is the following thing. We're going to work in uh, fixed time periods. So not continuously, just like in the kidney exchanges where they do every three months. I'm going to uh, do, make decisions at time tau, two tau, three tau, four tau, and so on. I'm going to do nothing in between decisions. Uh, and at every decision epoch, I'm going to do something very simple, which is just solve a static optimization problem, static matching problem. I'm going to look at my queues, how many do I have of each type, and just maximize reward given how much I have in my queue. So I solve this optimization problem. Okay, so it's basically a resolving, a resolving policy on discretized time epochs. And what we show is the following. If general position holds and the graph is acyclic, then this batching policy with tau chosen carefully achieves a hindsight optimality that is proportional to one over epsilon. So let me uh, parse this slowly. Uh, the time between decisions is a constant times one over epsilon. Okay, so that's how we fix it. And uh, if you do that, you can be nearly optimal at all times up to one over epsilon. Now the constant embedded in this big O 
depends on the network structure, on the number of types, but it's true for any, it's uniform of all possible arrival rates that have the same epsilon. That's what matters. What matters is this epsilon. And we also show that you can never do better. Meaning any policy has to be at least at some time t, one over epsilon away from its upper bound. Okay. There's no policy that can be uniformly over time better than one over epsilon. Now, let me just connect this to queuing and, and uh, because kind of is interesting. One useful way for me to think about epsilon is the slack in the system. So epsilon is very similar to one minus rho in a queue. It's the buffer of idleness kind of that you have, the protection that you have. And this is then very similar to scaling results that we know in queuing networks by Yuan, Neil, and others that show that the optimal scaling is one over one minus rho. Right, so that, that has a very similar spirit in it. And that the lower bound, that the best, the best scaling that you can achieve is also one over one minus one. Maybe I'll pause for questions. Um, I have a quick question. Yes, uh, So uh, like you said, your policy is such that you never use those redundant uh, matches. Uh, I wonder because of that, the dependency on the number of types would get worse because you're not kind of like resource pooling in some sense. It, it, it's true that in general, the bound, the constant depends on the number of types and it will get worse with the number of types. I don't know that it's because of what, of this decomposition. I think this is true in general. Okay. So it's true for any policy. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I have a quick clarification question. Maybe I missed this earlier, but R is defined for each time period just for that time period or is accumulated up to that time epoch? So this increases linearly with T. Okay. And this increases linearly with T. If you okay. have a reasonable policy, well, if it's constant away from the upper bound, then it's also has to be linear in T. Okay, I see. It's the total accumulated or collected reward by time. Thank you. Sir, I have a quick question. Yes. Sir, what, what is the, can you clarify a little bit on the acyclic here? Does that mean something like, like a three cycle, like three way exchange is not allowed here? Yeah, I, I'm just- No, 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 no. It, okay. it means acyclic, very good question. Uh, in the way we plot the graph, this for example is acyclic, although it has a four way match. Okay, I'll show a graph with, with a cycle, uh, actually. Sorry, it's, it's a cyclic, a cyclic for the bipartite version of the graph, right? No, it's a cyclic for the way we plot it here. Right, if I look at this graph, this graph, for example, has no cycles in it, although it has a multi-way match. Okay. I'll show you an example with a cycle in the that hopefully will make it a bit clear. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the point is, if you have this non-degeneracy condition, then you can do uh, this well. Uh, let me also, I think it's, it's valuable to connect this to things that are known in um, network revenue management, which is a somewhat different resource allocation problem. Uh, but there also, there is a well-known result or the first result in, in that context by Stefanos Jason and Sunil Kumar was that if the, static planning problem for the research for the network revenue management problem is not degenerate, then a very simple resolving heuristic is constant, has constant regret relative to the upper bound. And what this non-degeneracy does, it's 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 actually it's not uh innocent assumption, it's a strong assumption. It means if you think about non-degeneracy, it means that you have a neighbor uh, where you can change the arrival rates and the same basis remains optimal. Which means that small level of stochasticity still maintains the same basis optimal. That's kind of important both for that result on network revenue management and for our results here. So if it's not, it's, it's, a, it's an assumption that is important and I want to emphasize that. Uh, a few final comments on this result. You don't want to wait more than one over epsilon. So one over epsilon is very kind of a knife edge thing. If you wait more than one over epsilon, you have regret that it's bigger than that. Why? Because if you think about how the queues behave between decision periods, because you don't do anything and we don't have abandonments, 
the queues just go up between decision periods. If you wait more than one over epsilon, let's say epsilon is less than one, and you wait one over epsilon square, your, your suboptimality just before a match is going to be one over epsilon square. Right? And because I want to be optimal at all times, that would contradict that. So one over epsilon is, is the most given the lower bound. And um, yeah, so, so it's kind of, uh, and the point here is that you want to have, you want to wait not too much, but you want to wait enough to get enough kind of concentration so that pre-solving works. Uh, some examples here, uh, a small example that shows that uh, with a suitable choice of the resolving period, we get a regret that is constant in time. Okay, so at each time we compute the upper bound, which is like waiting and not doing anything up to that time versus what our policy did by that time. And a larger example, uh, again, a graph that shows that my regret reaches up to a level of about 300. My highest value match here is 100, which means that the policy does effectively three mistakes over the horizon, no matter what the horizon is. Um, yeah, okay. So yeah, one more thing to say, which is which I didn't emphasize. The smaller the epsilon, the bigger the gap, both in the lower bound and the upper bound. When epsilon gets to zero, I kind of move away from a non-degeneracy assumption. So non-degeneracy breaks when epsilon is zero, right? So you get closer and closer to that um, regime that is problematic. Uh, but this means that the smaller the epsilon, meaning the less slack you have in the system, the more you have to wait, which kind of makes sense intuitively. Okay. Um, yes, if the graph is bipartite, uh, then even if there are cycles, that's okay. So that goes to Yewa's question. Um, <clears throat> and the next question is what happens in two way networks? Is this waiting really necessary? So let me say a few words about two way networks. First, I'm going to use a slightly different graphic depiction here uh, that is maybe familiar uh, to some people. Um, <clears throat> if I have only two-way matches, I can plot the graph in the following way. I put a node for each agent type and an edge between them if they match to each other. I couldn't do this before because before I had matches of three types. So I use this rectangle and three edges coming out of it. So this is a two-way network where each uh, match connects two types. Okay. And, uh, what we establish is that in two-way networks, meaning where each match matches only two types of agents, there exists a greedy policy that is hindsight optimal. Not any greedy policy is hindsight optimal. You have to be careful. For example, if a type two arrival, if I have a type two arrival and queues one and three are both non-empty, there's still a decision to be made. And what decision I make actually matters. And we show two results in this context. One, we show that a longest queue policy suitably modified in a way that depends on the LP solution is hindsight optimal. Um, and we also show the same thing for a certain static priority policy. Uh, the benefit of a static priority policy versus longest queue is that it's state independent and that some people could view that as appealing from a practical perspective. I just order the types in some order of priority, and then I match according to that priority order. No additional optimization is needed. And then we have the following result. Uh, if I have general position and the, and the uh, graph or the matches are all two way, then the greedy longest queue policy is hindsight optimal, meaning it achieves the one over epsilon uh, scaling. For the static priority policy, unfortunately, we are able to show that it's hindsight optimal. We could not nail down the constant and how it depends on epsilon. And the reason is that the analysis is actually much more complex. Um, the longest queue uh, has, a, has the application of max weight and similar policies in other contexts is a very nice behavior. And it's very amenable to analysis using the Apono functions. The static priority policy is much more complicated in that sense. Um, 
So those, those have, who have experience with analyzing longest queue uh, can uh, relate to that. Um, determining the priority order uh, is, is relatively easy. Uh, one way you can think about this is that you basically, in each, uh, when you solve the LP for a two-way network, each component, after I remove the redundant matches, will have a single non-empty queue. That is just a result of counting variables in the linear program. So you'll have one queue that has a positive thread variable. You take that queue and you hang the network from that queue. And basically that generates priorities where the highest priorities are at the bottom and the lowest priorities at the top. And then whenever you match, you prioritize the types below you for match instead of those below. So, so it's uh, somewhat straightforward. Any questions? Maybe a quick question. Yeah. I, just trying to interpret epsilon. So is that you've got your unique optimum and then is epsilon basically the next extreme point in your LP? If you know what I mean. So you've got your optimum here, then you've got the next corner that's off optimal. Is, is, that, is that a good way to interpret epsilon there? It's true, yeah. So when epsilon gets to zero, then I have yeah. a, a degenerate basic optimal solution. Yeah. Where I have in the basis one one match or one queue that is basic variable yeah. that is valued at zero. Yeah. So then you have maybe multiple bases that are. Yeah, that are yeah. Because yeah. I think you're like you you kind of got your ne next closest to the optimum point, and then that's sort of shrinking down to all the you know yes. the, all the planes going up. And, uh, and, 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 and also sort of following on from that a little bit, um, like if you thought like kind of multi arm bandit problem regret there, there'd be a Maybe this is just the same words used, but you'd have like a gap dependent bound and a gap independent bound. And the gap dependent bound would say, provided the difference between, you know, the optimal one and the next not yes. optimal one is there, then yes. you get logarithmic yeah, like the regret. separation, the separation. Yeah. And then if, if you, if, and then if you've fixed the time period T, you can move that gap to be, and that's sort of the same thing that's happening here, more or less, I guess. Yeah. It's an interesting uh, connection. Yeah. yeah okay. Thank you. Uh, so the key, the key insight here, so it's not, it's not the policy themselves, but the fact that if you have only two-way net two-way matches, then actually there is no value to waiting, right? Uh, there's no need to wait. There's no significant value in doing that. You can be simultaneously nearly optimal for all times t. Uh, if you have multi-way matches, you do have to wait, but how much you wait is actually not a lot and can be identified as depending in a very explicit way on, on the structure of the network and the parameters. Uh, here's an, an example of static priority policy that we just kind of have to, um, the conjecture sort of, that even though we cannot prove the one over epsilon for the static priority policy, it does still have the one over epsilon. So what you see here on the right is uh, on the x-axis one over epsilon, on the right axis, the regret for this example. And you see that uh, this is really uh, constant over epsilon regret. Uh, but again, we, we couldn't prove that. We only could prove that regret does not grow with T, but we could not show that uh, it's one over epsilon is the constant. Um, uh, in the remaining time, let me maybe say, I'll uh, just say a few words about the analysis, uh, more about the lower bound in, in a very uh, in, intuitive, not mathematical level. And, and then maybe just a few words about the upper bound, which is uh, using some standard tools. So, uh, and, and maybe also discussing the lower bound, I think uh, shed some light on what is going on here. So if you think about the regret at the given time T, the decision maker that waited up to T and did nothing is going to empty some of the queues under the optimal match. So some of the types that arrived are going to be fully served. Okay, so at that time T, those queues have to be empty. In the real stochastic dynamic system, I'm going to have some work in those queues under my policy. So these jobs in the queue are unrealized rewards, right? These are rewards that the upper bound is actually would have realized because it would match them, but my dynamic policy is not. So what I really wanna do to bound the regret is bound those queues. I need to bound in expectation the length of those queues 
that the LP wants to make zero, but I'm not making them zero in my dynamical system. So it's all about bounding the queues. And all our proofs are based around like the scaling of the queues and then translating that to rewards. So for the lower bound, it's useful to look at this very simple network with three types, arrival rates one, 1.1, 1 .1, and two. These are supposed to be probability. So think about this up to normalization. Um, and these are the rewards. So the arrival rates here are very large compared to the arrival rate of this and this. Uh, and let's actually fix a policy, although in improving lower bound, you cannot fix a policy, but let me fix a policy that does the following. When a type two arrives, if there's any work in type one, two matches with one. So two basically prioritizes one. However, if this queue is empty, this type two will immediately match with the type three that is available and disappear. Okay, so I'm being greedy. Greedy, but prioritizing type one over type three when there's a type two arrive. So how does the type Q, the Q1 behave? Q1 behaves as follows. There is an arrival of a rate of one and it goes up and it goes down at a rate of 1.1 because whenever there is a type two arrival, if Q1 is non empty, they are going to match. So basically I have an MM1 Q going up at rate one, going down at rate 1.1. Okay, so we know that the, the Q here is going to be roughly one over one minus rho, which is here exactly one over epsilon, right? Because my epsilon is, um, my epsilon is 0 0.1 in this example. Okay, so, so you can see why, why this epsilon, which is basically the slack that you have from some matches for those matches on the other side, determines the outcome. Of course, in a general network, it gets more complicated. And also for proving a lower bound, you cannot fix a policy, right? You can, you have to show it over all possible policies, but there is a very uh, clean connection to, to just the length of queues here. Uh, the upper bound, as I said, the key is to try to bound in expectation and at all times, not just the stationarity, the queues of those types that are supposed to be empty under the LP. And of course, the standard tool for doing these things is the Apono functions. Um, but once you find the Lyapunov functions, this is all fairly uh, standard. Um, let me just flesh this out. Uh, Suleiman was on the job market. So of course he had to show, to show that he can do some uh, fancy math. So we have this slide with all the Lyapunov functions. Uh, but, but again, the, the, this is a fairly standard tool. Uh, the more complex case here is the static priority policy. Um, but uh, once you have that, it all works out. So the upper bound is, bounding the queues and then translating it to bound the regret. One last comment on the math. I'm not going to go over the slide, but there's something very interesting about this matching networks that if you look at the static planning problem, it actually is a very clean closed form solution. Uh, and that closed form solution is very useful to us in building and analyzing the Lyapunov functions. functions. Um, so here it's just a slide where we have this closed form solution. Um, and it's a, a lot of the analysis in the paper is actually around the linear optimization problem and not around the stochastic analysis. Uh, so final comments. Um, we introduced this idea of hindsight optimality to study the trade-off of short-term and long-term tensions. Uh, it, under some condition, you can be uh, near optimal at all times, but that's not always true. So these conditions are needed. Um, we can identify the scaling of the regret as a function of the network parameters. And in multi-way matchings, you actually have to wait in two way, you do not have to wait at all. There is a way to draw results from here also to uh, holding cost minimization, as long as there is a very specific connection between rewards and holding costs. By specific, I mean at the very least you want that if there's two types that with very high delay cost, the reward for matching them should be very high as well, right? So you kind of need this connection. And if you have that, uh, then we can actually draw some things from our analysis. We uh, did not have abandonments here. Abandonments, of course, introduce a force or a reason to act quickly or in real time or to be more greedy. The question we ask here is actually to abstract away from that and ask, is there uh, at all a cost to acting greedily? 
even if I didn't have abandonments, do I lose anything by acting now versus acting later? And the answer is the one I outlined before. Uh, but a student of mine, Angela, is uh, now working on the model with abandonments. And there's some uh, very interesting recent work uh, by Amy and co-authors, uh, Fushil and uh, Shiva and others on uh, this system of these abandonments. So let me stop here and take any remaining questions if there are. So. Please feel free to unmute yourself if you have any questions. Hi, Itai. Yes. Um, I have a quick question about the example that you said it cannot do better than square root t. Yes. So like, it seems that you, that in that example, you assume you do not know the number of periods. So if you know the number of periods, I know it's a little, might be a strange question, but what, what happens if you know the number of total number of periods? No, I think this is related to what Amy asked before. I mean, even if I know T, I could try to target T, to target to try to do well at T, but what I was saying is that then you'll be suboptimal at T over two. So the fact that you know the number of periods, doesn't change anything. What matters is that I measure optimality throughout. If you only care about being optimal at time t, then in my model, the best thing for you to do is actually to wait until time t. Don't do anything. Just wait till t and match. Right? Okay. The only reason for you to act earlier is because I also want to be optimal in two weeks from now. I'm not satisfied being optimal in three months from now. Sure. Thanks. Um, I guess I'll ask one more question, if that's okay. Yeah. Could you say a little bit more about the intuition for the general position gap? I, I, I think uh, you sort of already asked the answer to question like with the two-way network, but I, I, I'm still having a little bit of trouble. Yeah, so let, my... me, let me actually, I think that's a good question. I don't think I explained it clear. Let me try to uh, explain general position gap in a, in a different way. Um, in Q networks, we, we have, if we have servers and customers, right? What we would want to compare is for a given set of customers, what is the capacity of all the servers that serve them? Correct? Right? So you look at the set of customer types, you look at the yes. servers, the capacity of all the servers that serve them, and kind of the difference between those would be, uh, the ratio between those would be your utilization. Yes. Right? So here, the point is that customers are also servers. So take one set of customers, take another set of customers that serve them, and look at the difference between the rates of the two, right? Because the rates of the servers are the service rates. Okay. So that difference, that difference is closely related to epsilon. Okay. But calling that epsilon is a bit too strong because that difference could be zero in some sets. Uh, it doesn't have to be, but that's basically the epsilon. It's the it's your Slack service time above service rate above your input. Does that mean if epsilon equals zero, I can sort of look like it as a critically loaded system, like a row equals one, capacity arrival rates equal? Yes. Yeah, so for, so for example, uh, in our paper, uh, we have an example that doesn't satisfy this assumption, uh, the general position assumption, uh, and it's critical loaded. And then what you have is that in the static planning problem, all the queues are zero. We cannot handle that in this paper. We cannot handle that. We need that there is some slack in the system in order to achieve this constant okay. word at all times. So yes, so epsilon zero is critical loading. Epsilon greater than zero, I think of that as overload. Thanks, that's really no, but it's But saying overload is a bit funny because it's, it's not necessarily overload, it could be also, right. it's like there's overcapacity, right? So it's-, it's Imbalanced? It's imbalanced, yes. Um, so I have a quick question about the information uh, of the arrival rate. It yes. seems that you only need to know that to determine like whether your system satisfies these conditions or not. But in the actual control, yes. you don't use the arrival rate information at all. Is that correct? So what I need to know, I use it a bit. 
So what I need to know is what is the optimal basis. I need to know which queues are empty and which queues are non-empty under the optimal LP solution. I see. Any arrival rate that gives the same basis as the true arrival rate, so any arrival rate estimate that is good enough to give me the same optimal basis is fine. Okay, I see. Okay, and of course, non-degeneracy will also help you there a bit, mm -hmm. right? Because it means that you have some perturbation within which you're still okay. So you will not lead too much of a learning horizon to actually uh, get things to work, but it's very important for us that you know the optimal basis. In contrast, for example, to uh, Sasha's work in this regard, where, where in the terms of what I presented here, uh, Sasha Stoller, I mean, uh, discovers the optimal, the basic solution mm -hmm. by itself through its actions instead of actually having to learn it. So for us, it's actually important to be able to uh, know the optimal basis. See. Quick comment. This yeah. feels like it could be, you know, it, it, this is done for matching, but it, to what ex it, static planning problems are usually like in the kind of Harrison kind of static yes. planning problem. Yeah. It would seem like this would apply in that case. Is, is, would that be right in the, in the sense of like, so sort of Brownian networks and activity activities and things like that? Is, 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 that, is that correct? Or so, so there is, is there is a, specific there is a about matching, or it, it can be a general matrix here? Uh, or, or, or can, can you consume more than one person from one queue no. and half a person from or one person from you know what I mean? Yes. So, so in, in in the sense of the kind of Harrison yes. stuff planning. So problem. there is there is a connection uh, between the the language and the modeling tools in the sense of, yeah. uh, for example, in the work with Amy, what we basically use there is kind of an ana analog of the workload formulation, equivalent workload formulation, but for matching networks. So something you can do with the duals and so on that. that there is something that is very interesting about these matching networks that make them very different from queuing networks. And it's yeah. the fact that uh, you can inventory your Slack, right? Mm -hmm. The problem with, with just an MM1 queue is if there are no customers, the capacity of the server, the, the server is, service times are lost, right? Yeah. Uh, but here, because customers are the servers and they wait, you can kind of inventory your capacity. So yeah, you don't have okay. reflecting boundaries, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. And that makes these systems actually, in, in very interesting ways, much easier. Yeah. Then, and, and I guess, I guess, the sort of thing is like, could you have people re-enter after being matched or something like this, or have you know, sort of routing or anything like this? Uh, it, it just sort of, you know, it sort of feels like it's you haven't you used anything other than the matrix M, and uh, you know what I mean. Rather, than, if you sort of mean, so it sort of feels like yeah, you no, could probably generalize that LP quite a bit. We use the specific structure of M, yeah, in very important ways in uh, in our analysis. Okay, the fact yeah. that you can build a closed firm solution and so on uh, turns out to be very valuable. Okay, yeah. for us at least. I mean, it could be yeah, someone okay, yeah, yeah. in a different form, shape, different way. You had a question, Sushil. Seems like you have a question mark in there. No. Now I was just thinking if if you extend it to like steady state, then you cannot uh, escape that reflection kind of thing because you want some drift uh, to make it stable. So Correct. Instead... So so one thing that is in, well the, in these networks with our structure of arrivals and so on, there is no steady state. Right, yes. It's always the, 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 the mark of chain is not uh, positive recurrent. Um, but you could talk about longer on average behavior of those queues that are, that are empty in the static planning problem that you could talk of. Uh, you just cannot talk of steady state for the other queues as long as you don't have abandonments. Of course, once you have abandonments, that problem is resolved, but other challenges uh, arise, of course, from abandonments, which is that people abandon. And, and that, that forces you to, to act differently. There, there are some things that seem to survive um, into, you know, that's a side comment and not directly to your question, that survive, some structures that survive as you start thinking about abandonments, as long as you allow yourself this general position assumption. Yeah, that makes sense, thanks. All right. Uh, if there's no more questions, then let's thank the speaker again. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.
Stop the recording.